on efficiency, excellent. Uh, we'll move on to item number nine, which is on page 67, which is the regional policy statement implementation update. We have Alejandro coming back to the table. Through you, Mr Chair, if I can just say a couple of words. So uh, in advance of any questions that may be asked, this is a statutory requirement. It's a regional policy statement, which sets out, it's the highest level document under the RPS and it directs our regional plans and our uh, territorial authority uh, district and city council plans. Um, it is also uh, important in terms of section 35 reporting back on um, is, is our policy being implemented? There's no use spending the money and doing the work and not implementing the policy. And um, also uh, to highlight where it isn't being implemented, and Alejandro will take you through those parts in the report, which are very few, as he's identified in paragraph four there. Um, and in terms of the budget, this is within the standard RPS implementation operating budget. The generation of this report is staff time. Leandro. Thank you for that update, Tracy. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, very little to act, just to bring your attention to the executive summary, which very much uh, sums up the contents of the report. And there's a brief mention of the number of methods that we have under the regional policy statements. So that's 246. Um, I'll talk to the slide that you have in front of you just in a bit. But is in essence, what we're doing with this report is uh, looking at the actions that we've taken to implement the regional policy statement, what has shifted based on uh, strategic priorities, what has been halted based on either national direction or because it's been superseded by other pieces of work. So that's the table that you see attached to this report. Um, in general terms, we have only three projects that have not been initiated, uh, three that are off track and four that have been halted, all for different reasons. But like I said, this is due to resource constraint, changes in strategic direction or practical considerations related to similar work. Um, there is on page 68 of your agenda pack, you'll see a small table with three um, bubbles that uh, split the work between internal, external programs and projects. So this is related to what you see in the slide behind you. This is the only slide accompanying this report. And is the responsibilities that we have under the Resource Management Act to one, uh, have a regional policy statement. So we actually need the regional policy statement under direction. And then once we have that direction uh, internally, regional plan and a regional coastal plan have to give effect to the regional policy statement. Externally, district plan reviews have to give effect to the regional policy statement. And this is driven through submissions, mediations, appeals, and why could um, the WRPS implementation agreements that we work with different territorial authorities. And another one of recent has been, which is a mix of a program and an external uh, way of implementation, future proof, as um, some of you know. And then the programs vary depending on different units, but I've highlighted a few examples in that table. Um, so as you can see, the um, hierarchy is very, very clear. This is from the Resource Management Act, and I just got the quality planning website. There's a good graphic to show you um, which um, instruments, the ones in red are the ones that are required by legislation. Then from those in red, there's a few that we advocate for the implementation of the policy direction. And we do that through the submissions work, and you will see actually uh, the final item in your agenda is the submissions update that we bring to you on every meeting for the Australian Policy Committee. Um, finally, in uh, paragraphs uh, 11 and 13, we just highlight um, a few examples where we've made progress just to bring them to your attention. Like I said, for the uh, submissions work, uh, we have the White Tomo District Council, so that's a full plan review, and we've stacked the provisions, the um, proposed provisions against the regional policy statement and made specific comments. Uh, uh, two bundles of plan changes from Taupo District, a full plan review from Waikato District Council, uh, another bundle of plan changes from South Waikato District Council, and uh, another bundle of plan changes from South, uh, from Matamata Piako District Council. 
in uh, page 13, there's a few bits of work that you may be uh, familiar with. So it's the work that we do in natural hazards strategy and implementation. This is the development of the regional methodology to assess the risk from natural hazards. And that's been accompanied by the work done by the resilience uh, team. And that's the collection of all the hazards information, modeling, and everything that allows us to uh, ascertain the level of risk from a specific hazard that a community may be under. Uh, change one to the regional policy statement that was in response to the national policy statement for urban development. And that has um, gone to hearings, and I believe it is now in waiting for decision, if I'm correct, Tracy. Sorry, uh, I changed one to the regional policy statement. Yes, it's presently going through deliberation. Um, and converting the regional policy statement to the national planning standards form. Um, so that is in, in essence what the report is. Um, then as Tracy mentioned, there's a brief description of the different work programs. So this table in attachment one refers to those programs where we're working. So that's not um, strictly the internal and external, it's more the programs that we have across the organization um, that uh, essentially is how we divvy up the resource to implement many of the actions identified in through the methods. I'm happy to take questions now. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, Alessandro. Um, the, uh, the regional policy statement has a lifespan of 10 years, starting in 2016. So when are we doing a review and an update? And will that be part of this LTP? Trade next week. Being that I am reading right at the very moment, as well as obviously being attuned to the committee, the spatial planning bill that's just been released, um, and I just got to the requirements, general contents and regional spatial strategies, I would not be advocating to council that we review our regional policy statement as the regional spatial strategy uh, is, for all intents and purposes, a uh, regional policy statement with whistles and bells. However, we have, as Alejandro identified, the MPS for urban development. We have an MPS for highly productive land, an MPS for freshwater management, likely to get an MPS for indigenous biodiversity by the end of the year, possibly, and a new national planning framework by the end of the year. So we may be mandated to do um, changes to our RPS. However, as I said yesterday, I wouldn't be looking to add anything more to our already pretty crowded policy program without fully digesting the new bills. Do we have to take account of all those NPSs? What sort of time cost are we looking at? So in terms of that, you will have that in detail. Um, probably, if not by August, and definitely November, when you have the first of your detailed sessions. So the timing was uh, the overview slide that I put up yesterday. In terms of the costings, as I said yesterday, we bring full of comprehensive uh, policy review program package to the LTP. It, it's usually um, across uh, the ten-year period. Of an LTP, it's about uh, 20 to 30 million. Um, so across a three-year LTP cycle, it's around to 12 million dollars. And that's something we can't not mandate it. To... As I explained yesterday, we are given we have a a recipe which to date has been the RMA, but will be these new acts. There are things that we must do. There are some things that we can choose to do, and then we have the opportunity to size that. As I explained, we commonly do a, a low, medium, and high scenario and talk councillors through the, the risks associated with choosing each of those scenarios. So we have things we must do, and then we have uh, some discretion as to how we size that job. As when I read this report and I saw paragraph three, 
WRP assessed 246 methods, which Alejandro mentioned first up. That really started to scare the hell out of me. And so far as if you need 246 just for this piece of work, is this creating work or is this necessary? I suppose, again, not a question, but I can turn it into one. Um, this really gives me great concern as to the establishment, and I suppose what I'll be looking for during the LTP, and, and so I'll signal it early, is a um, a chart of the establishment chart, not with people's names, but what is it that people do, uh, and why, um, and whether we should be in that business, and and so on. So I don't want to cross the line between governance and operational, but the reality is if this piece of work generates 246 methods, what does all the other work do? And is, is it all necessary? So that, that's just a question, and it's not directed at Alejandro, but towards the chief executive through you, Tracy, I suppose, going forward for the LTP. And maybe it's something I may raise this afternoon. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, just looking at this statement on the freshwater catchment, we've got eight catchment management zones. Note that the, that um, one of those, the Coromandel zone, has been reviewed in 2017. Just, I guess, for you, Tracy, is it proposed that the NPS will replace these, or does? Won't be a need to review the plans then. That, that my understanding of it, correct? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. That that's a really good um, observation. We have we developed the RPS back in the um, I guess operating environment of the time. The central government direction that's given us um, some cues as to what we needed to reprioritise, and we've done that. So I guess particularly at the Bottom of page 73, um, there's a reference there to plan change two. We'd always said after we'd done plan change one, we'd do Hauraki Coromandel. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen, and now we're doing it through our fresh order policy review. The region is divided into eight catchments, and there are zone plans. Now, those zone plans happen as of course, and they're already part of our usual business as usual. What is important is this document, while it may have the 200 plus measures, a lot of those are actually embedded at business as usual because resource management is such a core part of everything this organisation does. There may be some that come with an additional cost and we put that together in the implementation plan. So these ones here you've identified, um, they these are zone plans that are funded through integrated catchment. They were talked about yesterday. They are not required by statute. But they're a bloody good idea if you want to know what what the integrated plan is for that that zone. Yep. So some of these, as as Alejandro said, some of these uh, responsibilities have been, um, I guess, absorbed into other projects. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Tracy, Tracy, if I just have a look at the table first, and the ones that were yellow or red took my attention first. The transmission management corridor approach, we said we hadn't, haven't commenced, but is that something that we would look at with the energy? Uh, that is definitely something that we'd look at when we do our energy stock taking strategy. That is very symptomatic of a very topical issue at the time when the RPS started, mm -hmm. which was a, a certain uh, national transmission corridor through the Waikato. So you can see when, when these things start, issues yep. that were very important then over time dissipate, but it will definitely be incorporated. Um, the other one was aquatic pest management advocacy. Um, it talks about waiting on further action from NPS. I uh, just wanted to understand what that was. Oh, yeah. uh, so the best thing there is to look at the agenda item that we had in our last Stratum policy agenda presented by Brett Bailey on mm -hmm. the work that we're doing, uh, and Alistair Fairweather on the work that we're doing with the Top of the North Partnership yes. on um, that marine biosecurity. And where this was one where Council gave us a very 
clear steer of not going into anybody else's business. Yeah. So at the moment, MPI, I think, had promised a go forward by the end of May. We haven't heard. They've been uh, dealing with a few other things in our region. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. advocacy keeps up. And the last one I had on there was the Coastal Marine Strategy talked about uh, purpose optimised opportunities provided by ecosystem services and briefly touched on that the other day. But since that has that the, strat the thing this is about, which is the coastal marine strategy, has largely been addressed by the coastal plan process. Where would I be likely to see this idea of ecosystem services of? Um, yes, is there one? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes yeah. to all of that. That uh, yes, the coastal plan kind of overtook that particular item, um, yep. gathered more momentum. So we did, as part of the coastal plan, some work with. We partnered with NEWA to look at embedding um, ecosystem services in the way that we approach the policies. I can fish out that piece of work for you. And in terms of our freshwater review, we'll definitely be looking at ecosystem services embedded in that as well. It's good to be aware of. And my very last one was just around paragraph 13. You're talking about natural hazard strategy and implementation. Uh, mindful we don't currently have any primary hazard zones. But we're looking, aiming to identify timeline, or perhaps on to work. So that's also. When did that conversation yeah, happen? So, <laughs> so that's a bit complicated by the movable parts down on Wellington at the moment. The advice that we had from the last week is with the new national planning framework. It is an amalgam of all the MPSs we have, as well as direction on natural hazards. So we wouldn't run that. Yep. Um, in terms of primary hazard zones, we set up the structure in the RPS uh, mm -hmm. for primary hazard zones should territorial authorities want to uh, investigate those options in full consultation with territorial authorities. No one's taken them up mm -hmm. as yet, yeah. but I think with the climate adaptation uh, bill before Christmas and the MPF national policy framework with focus on natural hazards, we'll see a lot more uh, on that. So we don't have a time yeah, at kind the of moment, like next but it's year yeah, we're a body of to... work that we need to kind of wrap our arms around. Thanks. Uh, Stu, I didn't know you had your mic on. Did you have a question? Yep. You want to pull it down? Oh, yeah. Those zones are more, um, they were structured that way for uh, um, basically to make it easier to manage the integrated catchment activities of, of the region. And, and the most recent one, the West Coast one, was only created well, eight years ago or something like that. Um, and to allow us to have structures, et cetera. So. Thanks for that, Ben. Oh, yes, yeah, just for Tracy. Um, just to clarify what you said before, that the RPS doesn't have to be reviewed statutory within our time frame, but has to be reviewed to take account of the NPSs that are coming through. Yes, yeah, so we have a an MP, the RPS must be reviewed within 10 years. It was operative in May 2016, so we would need to begin our review before May 2026. We've got new legislation coming in, so for me, I don't think that's a, a very judicious use of ratepayers' money. What we do have, though, is we have a number of national policy statements that have directed us by a particular time we must have gone through review. So December 2024 for the freshwater, we're presently going through the NPS urban development. We've got the NPS on highly productive land, which is said within two years we must achieve X and Y. So those are the ones that are operative now that we are giving effect to. So the only other piece of legislation, I think, um, and I haven't unpicked the 1,000-page MBA bill yet because I couldn't open Blair's link. Um, OK, cool. <laughs> um, but we'd need to see what, what if there is anything in the transitional provisions that says you, you need to make changes. If we get something in the national planning framework related to natural hazards, there may be another plan change in there. We won't know that until the end of the year. 
So what you're saying is you're coming back to us as part of the LTP in around August with your Skoda versus your BMW models for the costs of doing those plan changes in relation to the, 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 the national standards. Is that right? Yes, and, and I'd suggest that you ask me more questions around that this afternoon. Okay. Leandro, anything else? Um, just to add something to uh, uh, the question on primary hazard zones, um, it is right. Nobody's taking us up in the offer to directly identify primary hazard zones. Um, however, through the work we're doing with the adaptation planning, uh, one of the intentions is that after those plans identify risk for different areas, we will end up with areas that we understand where the risk is intolerable. And then we'll be able to work from that point. So it's not exactly the work as it is intended, but it's another way. And this illustrates how some of the shifting in priorities and the work we do shapes some of the results that we end up getting at the end of the day. Thank you. Oh, um, Warren, I really loved seeing about the combined regional. Uh, just a quick question that was because I love it when, when the TAs all work together on something. So I just wondered if that going well has that been going for quite some time or is that a new thing any comment on that i love it when we work so if i can just lead off before i hand over to leandro so that's been going um for at least 12 13 14 years now um it is something that uh we have maintained the momentum on and lizette and leandro and miffy have really uh used that as a focus area for connection um, in the last two years and also there is a, a standing um, invite to MFE. So everybody's hearing the same messages. Leandro, anything? Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Leandro. So we have the motion before us that the regional policy statement implementation be received. Okay, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Katarina. All those in favour? Opposed? So carried. Right, moving on. Item 10 is our long term plan project update. We have Haven joining us. Thank you. Morning, Chair. Morning, Councillors. Um, so this is just the regular long-term plan project update that the committee receives every time it meets. Um, the report there's a short and snappy report. So I'm hoping if the committee agrees that we can largely take it as read. Probably the only thing worth calling out is, and it also might be stating the obvious, is that we're in the middle of the levels of service workshop. We'll reconvene that workshop this afternoon. Continue to gather your direction, um, unpack that and come back to you on August 17th with rescopes, any rescope service levels to again receive your direction and figure out the next steps from there. But yes, happy to take any questions. Well done, you cleaned that 10 minutes out in one minute. So uh, I'll move that your report be received. Second in, thank you. All those in favour? Opposed? So carried. Thank you. And the last item on our list today is the submission summary report, June 2023. Can we have that now? Kia ora tato, uh, kou mifi toko ingoa. Um, so uh, this is our regular report on the um, submission opportunities that we have considered over the last period since the last um, committee meeting. Uh, so again, I'll take it as read. Um, I will just highlight that we have added a new section this time, which is an outcome section. So we had some key policies, policy decisions come out from um, government on the um, national environmental standards. Um, what's, what's the full title? It's uh, standards for human drinking water or something along those lines. Um, so we did make a submission on that and um, I've, done a high level comparison of what we said against what um, the government have decided so far, but there will be some more detail on that, which will have implications for our freshwater um, plan change. Um, just to note that the next um, 
Strategy and Policy Committee isn't till the start of September. So uh, submissions don't stop, but they keep coming in. So um, we may need some submission subcommittees in the meantime. Um, also, you've got your council break, so there may need to be some signed off under delegation. Um, and I'll just quickly whip through the, the key ones that have come through since we wrote this report. Uh, there's a new private plan change at Morrinsville for additional industrial land. Topo District Council ha have prepared a draft housing strategy, so we're looking at both of those to see whether we need to submit. Um, the water service bills have been reported back to Parliament, and there is a fourth bill out for consultation. Submissions are due on the 5th of July, so that only came out um, this week. It's a very short turnaround. Um, so this is basically to give effect to the changes that government have announced around the water legislations are changing the number of entities and when um, when it all kicks off. Um, so we, we are looking at that to see whether we need to submit. Uh, staying with water, the government has agreed to develop an exception for lower intensity farming in relation to the stock exclusion reg regulations. We did submit on this and were involved in um, workshopping the, the content. Um, so we're looking to make a submission on that one. There are... Exclusion of stock, they're supposed to be out by 1 July in, in two days' time. Yes, so um, there's an, it's, this is in relation to lower intensity farming that's getting caught, even though the intention wasn't for it to be caught. Um, something right. to do with the slope levels. I, I'm not across the technical details, so it's just a tweak to it. Yes, Joe. So just on that one, when, when will that submission be being put together? Um, at the moment, it's due the 16th of July. I, I'd be interested in seeing it as well, Paul. Yeah. We, I mean, where I, why I'm interested is have low intensity farming, but that doesn't preclude someone from doing really dumb stuff at a particular time. So make sure there's some sort of match that. Um, I agree with the intent. I'm sure that I do. I just want to make. I think we need to be confident and step in and do something if someone's doing some dumb stuff. Yeah, and that's picked up in the regulations. And well, that's fresh in my mind at the moment because I read the damn thing last night, which is, it didn't send me to sleep, funnily enough. <laughs> um, but it, it actually is really good explanation on those regs about the, this topic, yeah. yeah. I guess where I'm going, Tracy, is look at that stupid regional plan where you can only do some stuff in a creek if you sample upstream and approved I've done some absolutely impossible to implement because they just... So I guess we will be taking our lead, obviously, from our resource use directorate yeah. and the um, clients monitoring and enforcement guys here to make sure that, um, you know, we're not having an unintended consequence yeah. of the government um, responding to those farmers who are low intensity and are saying, oh, well, we're at, at lesser risk of causing an issue. Exactly what you say, whether you you can be a high high intensity farmer and be very low risk because of how you operate on yeah, your land. So, yeah, we'll have a look at it. Um, I will say I haven't read it, but there are people upstairs who have read it and will know technically um, if we need to submit or not. Go back to you now. Um, yeah. And just, um, is it empirical water? And, uh, ephemeral, the, you know, when the water's only there at certain times of the year? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So we need to make sure we cover that off as well because got one or two of those on my property and sometimes mm -hmm. rain's not expected, but you wake up and find cattle have actually, um, they're in there. And it's, while it's not a very big area, it's still, I don't want to break the rules. So mm -hmm. can we just cover that off? So I'll make uh, sure. I'll, if that's within the scope of the consultation, yeah, the then scope, um, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll pass that message on to them. So, so just picking up on that conversation, Tracy, is there a mechanism that, that we can, Make sure that councillors are, if we decide to submit, that councillors are made aware prior to our submission on that 17th of July, being as it's uh, we're away. If if there's time, but it's uh, it's likely that I'll be signing that one under. If we decide to submit, because we don't we don't submit on every change, but that one, if our um, team upstairs, um, particularly our primary industry team and our um, consenting team say, hey, for clarity's sake, we need to um, submit, then we will do that and make sure that send a copy around. Because we can't, uh, during recess, we won't be able to have a submission subcommittee. 
Oh. Sorry, um, and I don't want to be offensive or otherwise, but this is the issue that I raised with Chris McClay and the council before he left for Europe, in that I am responsible to the community and elected by the community to represent their views. To have delegated authority and not be having any input or constructive input into a submission or decision of this council, but be held accountable by the community for that is totally inappropriate in my view. And so I'm not having a go at you, Tracy. This is what previous councils have done. So if just because we are in recess doesn't mean to say we disappear off the face of the earth. I am available throughout July to be contacted and attend meetings. Others may have travel plans that they can't, but it does not stop council, council has been available to give feedback. And I would like to be uh, advised of the submission and have the opportunity to read it. Whether anyone listens to anything that I may or may not feed back is a different issue. The reality is councillors should not be excluded from giving input and delegated authority should not be used to stop councillors giving input. I absolutely find that reprehensible. So I'll take this up with Chris when he comes back and perhaps I'll have that in my discussion with you, Madam Chair. First of all, Uh, I, just to to um, articulate that there is no intention to specifically exclude councillors from providing in, input. That is that is not the intention of uh, this previous decisions and and direction that that council has taken. So um, just to make sure we set the record straight on that, that that is that is not what happens here. Um, there are times where we have delegated authority uh, um, that is uh, applied to, to directors, and that's just around uh, timely management of, of workloads and ensuring that we do provide the input. I, I do take on board that, um, that there is a desire from counselors to ensure that they are across things and have the opportunity to provide input and I'm sure that Tracy will take that into consideration as to, to how we might provide that uh, in the inter that opportunity during the recess. Does that mean that Noel can send an email to Tracy for her to consider as part of a submission? Well, we're all entitled to see it, but look, I just want to take, I think it's a bit rank to suggest that methodology has been used for staff to um to override our ability to have input. That's not the case, never has been the case uh, Noel. So I think you need to be a wee bit careful with his that with respect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The reality is I asked and the statement that I took to be was that we wouldn't have the opportunity. Uh, if I took the wrong inference from that, I apologize. The reality is I want to be as because I've got a vested interest in this uh, and I also have some inside knowledge. So I don't want to dictate what's in there. I just want to have the opportunity to read it and consider and give um, constructive uh, feedback. Can I suggest if that's necessary, then Chair needs to make sure that it's read in fairly if we don't end up with a scenario where one or two councillors have it. Okay. Um, I mean, we have the submission subcommittee for a reason. It's um, the first time in a long time had the concept of a recess. Just curious how many items might come up in July and um, mindful that it is a very small number. So it could be called if the, count, if the committee here so wished. Uh, it's not that big a deal. So that was kind of my question. How many might be likely to come up in the time frame? But from what I see, a lot of uh, it's not it's not that many that are still being assessed. So it looks like it would be quite. But Could a comment, Chris? Yeah, yeah, look, I was on numbers. I was at a refrain from commenting actually, but um, in terms of numbers, we don't know. Okay. I mean, we are operating in quite a thick and fast environment from central government. You'll appreciate. Some of what we've commented on, um, I think the shortest one, Alejandro, was two days, uh, one day. 
it should have got it on a Thursday and we had to have a submission by a Sunday. True. So um, I do want to give council the confidence that delegation is an exercise lightly, um, but we don't know. We're in that uh, government now must have about 15 sitting days before um, they rise for the election and they are ploughing through what they're ploughing through. So going back to the stock exclusion matter that Mickey raised, we don't know if we're going to make a submission or not yet. And any submission we make will be in keeping with the direction that councils previously provided us. Yeah. And so, so on a similar example, um, we had to move the joint working party meeting for Whadukawa Coast. I, as the co-chair of that, just checked in with the councillors that part of that as to whether they were available in July. But I suggest that if something comes up where um, the subcommittee might be called that Warren just checks in with, I think it's only really Chris and myself and uh, perhaps the chair, deputy chair, um, whether they're available and it is, and it's kind of sitting with the chair of Stratton Poll to help direct that. The power we've given to you. <laughs> and Excellent. Maybe, maybe we should review whether we have a, a recess next year. I mean, is it a valuable thing or not? First time we try. Chair, as councillors, we get paid 24-7. We don't get paid to take a break now and a break at Christmas. You know, we are available to the community 24-7. So we are I'm sure they'll still be ringing us, Noel. Yeah. Don't worry about that. And that's a that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. And here's set when the meetings happen. So go for it, Warren. Okay. Okay, um, so this will give you a bit of an indication of what we know already. Um, these, so these are being considered and won't necessarily all result in submissions, but we... Um, okay, so there are two new proposals relating to the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme to re redesign the permanent forest category in an over overall review based on advice from the Climate Change Commission. Uh, the Environment Committee has initiated an inquiry into seabed mining, NBR undertaking a review of the building consent system, and there is a draft tourism environment action plan um, to manage impacts on the environment from tourism. MPI are consulting on an aquaculture biosecurity program, Waka Kotahi are consulting on a sustainable public transport transport framework. Department of uh, the Prime Minister and Cabinet have a critical infra infrastructure phase one consultation. And then finally, um, not for consultation, but as feedback, which you're probably already aware of, Future for Local Government report is out and the RM Select Committee report is out. But yeah, we, we do check every week and there's usually always something new that comes through. So Yeah, thank you. And I mean, the, the out of that list you gave, the ones closest where I feel like our council should have opinion were the ones around the ETS, the Environment Action Plan for Tourism, and the PT framework, from my assessment. But you guys go for it. Have a chat to the chair. Thank you. Any other questions? No. The motion before us is that the report, uh, submissions summary report June 2023 be received. Over. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pam. All those in favour? Opposed? So carried. Yeah. Um, and to finish us off for uh, this session, I'll turn to James for the karakia to close. Thank you. Unahia, unahia, mai ti uru tapanui, ki awa tia, ki a mama, ki te nako, te tiana, te henagro, i Te ara takatu, koya ra e rongo, e fakakaria aka ki ronga, ki atina, tina, humie, huie, tai ki e. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, staff, for your reports and councillors, and lunch, I believe, is served next door. Uh, meet the meeting closed at twelve ten.